Let me introduce this evening's speaker. Dr. J.P. Moreland is a distinguished professor of philosophy at the Talbot School of Theology at Biola University. He did a PhD in philosophy at the University of Southern California, and he studied uh, not only philosophy, but theology and chemistry and a few other important disciplines. And uh, turns out he is really become an expert of making a nuisance of himself for Jesus in all the right places. We're just tremendously delighted to have him on the faculty, but more importantly, as a tremendous colleague, he's one of the finest encouragers I've ever seen in my life. And he, he takes those of us who are even just a couple of years younger and, and uh, leads us into the promised land of academic success and uh, discipleship uh, uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, really just pushing the kingdom of God forward at every turn. Dr. J.P. Moreland, we can't wait to hear what you have to say tonight. Well, I think with uh, what Bill Craig shared with us tonight, that I'll just close in prayer and we'll all go home. How does that sound? <laughs> you know, uh, with regard to that story, I'm afraid I have some good and bad news about it. Uh, let me give you the good news first. I think things like that are absolutely thrilling and wonderful. And I sat there with tears in my eyes, so encouraged to hear about this young man's journey. And I'm sure that you sat there thinking the same thing. It really doesn't get any better than that to see someone come into the kingdom of God and to begin enjoying a life with the Lord Jesus. The, the, this was, that is really, really good news. Um, I'm afraid I also have some bad news. And the bad news is that stories like that don't happen very often. And there's a reason for that and I want to share that reason with you this evening. A few years ago, I was in the Seattle airport after having spoken at a weekend retreat. It was Sunday morning. I was uh, waiting to get on my plane, and I picked up a copy of the Seattle Times newspaper. Uh, I made a beeline to the editorial page, and there the lead editorial, which was a page and a half large. That was a, it was a major editorial syndicated, by the way, so it was in many newspapers that morning around the country, was an article entitled, A Divided Nation. The author went on to say that we now live in the most divided period in the history of the United States, except the Civil War. Now, he went on to argue that the fundamental division that is dividing the American people is not a division over economics, politics, gender, or race. Now that was interesting because those are things that divide people. He said, no, there is a deeper, more fundamental division among the American people than all of those. The fundamental division that divides America is a division of worldview, a division of worldview. Now I practically fell off my chair because you seldom hear anybody but Christian thinkers talking about worldview, and yet there it was in front of God and everyone, right there on the editorial page of the Seattle Times. He went on to argue that there are two fundamental worldviews, I think there are really three, but there are, but, but there are two fundamental worldviews, he claimed, and on the one hand, we have a very secular approach to reality. I think that worldview divides into scientific naturalism, and postmodern relativism. But on the one hand, in any case, we have a secular approach to life. On that approach to life, the physical world is fundamentally all there is. Uh, moral values and moral law and moral behavior are basically uh, remnants of the evolutionary process. Instead of being objective features of the world, they are basically creations of evolution to help us survive and that we essentially have the freedom to create our own values, like you can change the two-point conversion in football to a one-point conversion. It's up to us. We can change moral rules anytime we want to because there's no objective truth about them. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, he argued, are ethical monotheists, of which evangelical Christianity, he claimed, is the primary version uh, in the United States currently. 
And according to ethical monotheism, there is a transcendent immaterial God who made us in His image, who has given us the moral law, uh, both through creation and through Scripture, and uh, who is real, and we owe our allegiance to that God. Now, he went on to say something that was not entirely encouraging. He said the leaders of the secularist movement are the universities and university professors, Hollywood, the entertainment industry, and the media. <laughs> I'm thinking, what else is there? <laughs> well, he went on then from there to say the leaders on the uh, ethical monotheism side are local churches. Now, <clears throat> I don't know about your local church, <clears throat> but mine doesn't look ready to handle this contest. And it's become evident that something very, very serious has happened in this culture because the centers of power and authority in North America have been dominated by secular voices for a long time now. And what that's done is create a context where ethical and religious claims are no longer taken cognitively. We no longer take moral and theological assertions to be either true or false, or if we, they are true or false, we do not take them as uh, the kind of claims anybody could know one way or the other. And so they, they devalue to the level of personal feeling and opinion. Now, this became very evident to me a few years ago when I was watching, and I don't typically watch this, Oprah Winfrey when she had her show. You have to understand I'm a very busy person, so I don't spend a lot of time watching Oprah, but I happened to be uh, doodling with the television that afternoon, and she was on. She had a program on God, and she got up and said, I want to spend the whole time in my show today encouraging people to seek God whoever he, she, it, or they is. And I don't think that we should get hung up in the word we use for her or them or it. The important thing is that you seek God, whatever it is to you. Now, if, now back away from that for a minute and think what that symbolizes about our culture, that television program. Contrast it with a situation where Oprah would, would spend a show talking about smallpox. Now, if Oprah was going to spend a, a, an entire show talking about the dangers of smallpox and what you can do to help your family not be vulnerable to those dangers, what do you think she would do? She would bring on her show what? An expert. What's an expert? An expert is somebody who knows something about an area that non-experts don't know. So if there are experts in medicine, we have to presuppose that there is medical knowledge, that it's actually possible to know something in medicine. Given that there's medical knowledge, we will call experts, people who have that medical knowledge, and we will let them speak with authority about issues medical. Oprah would not have opined about medical issues on her show because she doesn't know what she's talking about on that subject. She would have brought on an expert. The fact that she would speak on theology and religion as a TV talk show host tells us that she doesn't believe that there are any such things as experts in this domain of thought. And because, and, and because she doesn't believe that there are any experts, that means that she doesn't believe that religion is a cognitive area of life. There's no truth in religion, or even if there is, no one has a clue what, where it lies, and so one person's opinion, Oprah's, is good as another person's opinion, because at the end of the day, religion is primarily an expression of non-cognitive feeling. And I will grant that Oprah is an expert on how she feels. I'll grant her that, <laughs> right? The fact that she knew that there was a ready audience for this kind of thing in American culture tells us 
that she understands that we now live in an America that is increasingly believing that religion is primarily a domain of feeling that is no longer a cognitive issue. Now, the question that I want to raise this evening is how did we get to this point? Where exactly are we, and what can we do about it? How did we get here? Where is here? It's not whatever, as they say in Southern California. It's here. So where is here? How do we get here? Where is here? And what can we do to change things? Let me say briefly how we got to the current situation. When America was founded up until about the middle of the, 19, of the uh, 1800s, American Christianity was robustly intellectual. There was a deep concern for thought. Uh, 117 of the first 119 colleges that were founded in the United States were founded to promote the gospel ministry, and there are biblical passages and texts all over the libraries and the administration building, I did my PhD at USC. Uh, it was founded by Methodists. Above the major academic administration building is a group of statues, and they are Methodist circuit riders. And they're put up there, no kidding, to look down on the campus to make sure that USC doesn't swerve away from solid Christian doctrine. <laughs> well, they are statues after all. But that was not atypical. The minister was the primary intellectual leader of his community, and the university and the church worked hand in hand to promote Christian thought in the arts, in history, in literature, in philosophy, and other fields. And that was the kind of Christianity they believed in. Daniel Webster in 1788 made the following statement. Quote, the education of youth is an employment of more consequence than making laws and preaching the gospel, because the education of youth lays the foundation on which both law and gospel rest. And according to Webster, an educated citizenry has a better chance of, of, of sustaining good moral laws and of understanding and embracing Jesus Christ. And so on his view, education was even more fundamental than evangelism because education would eventually show forth the beauty of the Christian message and the Christian worldview. Unfortunately, this attitude did not continue. Can you hear me out there? Because it sounds like the microphone is going on and off. Can you hear me all right? Okay. Um, Always an odd question, isn't it? Um, because if you can't, what would be the point of asking it? So it's just, it's always been one of those self refuting kind of things. Um, in, the mid, in the mid 1800s, there were three, three words from heaven, and we just heard two of them. There were, there were three great awakenings that came into the United States. The main Great Awakening began in Upper State New York. It moved down the East Coast into Georgia, swept across into Kansas and Missouri, and that, along with two other awakenings, were huge to American Christianity and its future in this country. A lot of good happened in those awakenings. No one doubts that. People came to the Lord, uh, the, the Church of Jesus Christ expanded its numbers. Unfortunately, the awakenings were primarily anti-intellectual and were overwhelmingly involved in feeling and emotion. For the first time, for example, we began to have altar calls where after the gospel was preached in a very simple way, music was played to stir people's feelings so that they would feel a conviction and want to come forward and trust Jesus Christ as Savior. And there was an, a reduction of religion to having a good character and having deep, intense religious feelings, which are absolutely crucial. Don't hear me saying anything against emotion or against character because they're critical, but 
Christianity moved 18 inches south from the mind down into the belly and the heart area, and it became largely a religion of emotion. There were two things that happened as a result of that awakening. The first thing that happened was in Upper State, New York, that area became known to church historians as the Burned Over District because it had had so much emotion-laden gospel preaching that it tended to create a situation where people were burned out by revivals and by emotionalism, and it's no accident that, that three of the major U.S. cults began in that part of the United States. A Christian science around that area, the, the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses in that general vicinity. And if you look at the beginning of the Book of Mormon, it basically says that if you want to know if this is the Word of God, all you have to do is ask God, and He will give you a burning in the bosom, a fire in the bosom, to assure you that this, this book is true. Where did he get the idea, Joseph Smith and others, that you could test the truth of a religion primarily by the feeling in the heart that one gets when one picks up a holy text of some kind. I believe that one of the sources that he got this idea from were the awakenings that took place in that part of the world uh, of, of America in the mid-1800s. The second thing that happened was we developed an uneducated clergy. This was particularly true in the Baptist church, and I, I don't say that to be mean-spirited. This is just a historical fact. Um, the, the Baptist church uh, was numbers as well as the Methodists grew exponentially in these awakenings, and you had numerous converts, and there was a need to shepherd them, and the primary criterion for being a minister was that you felt a call to preach. And if you felt a call to preach that came over you, you could be ordained and you could be given a church to pastor and you could be as dumb as a goose <laughs> and not know anything at all. So you have a time where if you're going to teach literature or you're going to teach history, you need to know something. But if you're going to pastor a church, all you have to do is be sincere. You don't need to know anything to shepherd the house of God and to teach the people. Now, at this time, around the 1850s through the end of the 1800s, an intellectual assault came against Christianity. I can't go into detail on this. I've covered some of this in my book, The Kingdom Triangle, and also in Love Your God With All Your Mind. But by and large, um, Darwin, Darwin's uh, Origin of Species came out in 1859. I'm sorry about the, the microphone here. I don't know if I'm doing something wrong, but um, thank God I'm forgiven if I am. Um, so, um, uh, uh, the ideas of human Kant came across the ocean and began to infiltrate American education. And we have historical criticism of the Bible, especially the five books of Moses begin to spring up. And you understand, if you believe in a personal devil like I do, then you have to understand the movement of history, not only in terms of human causation, but also in terms of supernatural influence. And I believe it was no accident that these intellectual assaults came at just the time when the church was withdrawing from the life of the mind and emphasizing feelings. What you have is from the period of 1900 to 1925, 26, around in there, the evangelical movement came together. There was a critical meeting held in St. Louis, Missouri, where there was a strategy for the fundamentalists, as they were called then, to try to recapture the culture. Rather than addressing ideas with ideas, they decided to develop a political strategy. In the North, the strategy was developed to try to keep liberals out of the mainline denominations because secularization was beginning to creep into seminary education and there was a small but growing number of pastors that did not believe in the deity of Jesus or the virgin birth or things like that. And so in the North, the evangelicals said, we're going to hang on to our denominations and try to kick out the liberals. 
It backfired, and the evangelicals got kicked out and had to start their own denominations and their own seminaries because they lost Princeton and other mainline seminaries to the secular movement. Down south, the attempt was to keep evolution out of the public schools. And with the Scopes trial in um, 1926, the famous creation evolution trial, where you have the creationists losing that uh, and, and losing face in public, God died in America. Now, God is still alive, but when I say God died in America, I mean what Nietzsche meant by it, and that is that the concept of God no longer held sway over the culture. You begin to have, for example, in editorial, in the cartoon page of newspapers, in the editorial section, you have cartoons after the Scopes trial with fundamentalist believers looking like monkeys with a holy Bible in their hands, standing next to a strong, progressive secularist, and the contrast that was spoken was, you either be faithful to the Bible, in which case you become a dumb, ignorant person, or you become intelligent and well-educated and thoughtful, and you turn away from the Bible and buy into the contemporary scientific enterprise. Not a good set of alternatives. And so what we have is, after that, it takes until the 1960s for the death of God to spread out into the culture. And from 1960 until the present, from the, uh, present, from the Jesus movement until now, we have had a growing secularization of culture, and the result of that has been the privatization and the decognitivizing of religious claims. Now, let me illustrate that. I, in, in 1989, in the state of California, a document called the California Framework was, was, was made, which serves as guidelines for teaching science in, in, and religious issues in public science classrooms in the United States. And in that document, the following statement is made in order to give advice to teachers who may have children of Bible-believing families come to them and protest the teaching of evolution. And here is a statement in the California framework, which you can get in any public school in the state of California. It says as follows, quote, at times some students may insist that certain conclusions of science cannot be true because of certain religious or philosophical beliefs they hold. It is appropriate at that point for the teacher to say this, I understand that you may have personal reservations about accepting this scientific evidence, but it is scientific knowledge about which no reasonable person can doubt. And it is my responsibility to teach it because it is a part of our common intellectual heritage. Now, my point is not an issue about creation evolution. My point is deeper than that. It is to notice the cognitive descriptors used for science and the non-cognitive descriptors used for philosophy and religion. Science is called conclusions. Science is, is, is basically said uh, to be involved with evidence. There is such a thing as scientific knowledge. There's no reason to doubt this scientific knowledge. Religion and philosophy are called personal reservations. Yuck. Um, it, is, it is called um, philosophical beliefs. And so, on the one hand, you have beliefs and opinions, and on the other hand, you've got truth and rationality and knowledge. That is the division I'm talking about. That is the decognitivizing of religious truth claims. And as a result of that, the Christian church responds to this problem, my dear friends, not by incre increasing its devotion to the life of the mind, but by saying that we know Christianity is true by faith. Now, I'm going to tell you there's more in the Bible about knowledge than there is about faith. The Bible doesn't say that we have faith in God. The Bible says we know God exists. There may be differences of opinion among us as to how we know He exists, but the Bible is clear that there's knowledge of God and there's knowledge that He's real. 
Faith comes in at the level of placing confidence in God, but faith is not pitted against knowledge or reason. And yet, the California framework communicates that science is a matter of knowledge and objective evidence, and religion is a matter of private feeling and and personal beliefs. And that attitude has come from us. To illustrate that, I've been going to uh, Dr. Stewart, my dentist now, for 21 years. Uh, He's had his hand in my mouth more than anybody else I know. And um, about 15 or 16 years ago, he became a believer. And he has been on fire for Jesus ever since. Well, I remember uh, he has one of these offices where uh, there's a little partition between the different stalls, and you can hear what's going on in the one next to you. Uh, not restroom stalls, dental stalls, okay? I don't, I don't want you to think I'm odd or anything. Uh, so so what, what I was, he was a believer about three years, and I'm waiting for him to see me, and he's doing something in this guy's mouth, and he's witnessing to him. And this guy, ha, ha, ha. And he's, and he's telling him about the gospel, and, he's, and I'm not kidding. He was, he was sharing this. It was, it was wonderful. So after it was over with, he comes over and starts working on me, and I said, hey, Doc Stewart. I said, way to go, man. I said, that's the way to do it. And, uh, and, and I said, were you able to answer some of his questions? And, and he said, oh, he said, you know, no. He said, I don't need to get, I don't worry about all that kind of stuff because at the end of the day, this is all about faith anyway. Now, I thought to myself, where in the heck did he get that idea? Where did he get that idea? Christianity has not taught that for 2,000 years. Throughout the vast majority of church history, the Christian community took itself in its creeds and in its central teachings to possess a body of knowledge, not a body of faith. Faith is important, but it wasn't a substitute for knowledge. You you have knowledge in the Scriptures. It was clear to me that he got it from us. So how do we get here? We got here by abandoning the life of the mind in the local church, these awakenings sweeping in in the mid-1800s, causing the Christian religion to be reduced to feeling and opinion, and the evangelical community withdrawing from the intellectual world and the culture because of an intellectual assault at the end of the 1800s, early first two decades of the 1900s, and the Christian community withdrew. Now, where does that mean we are right now? Where we are is an increasingly secular culture. Because as the church withdrew, a vacuum was was filled, and the university replaced the the church as the authority over culture. It is the university that has the right to define reality today, not the pastor. Now, as a result of that, the, the secular culture we live in is fundamentally about the nature and the limits of knowledge. It is not about promiscuous sex. It is not about politics. It is, secularism is fundamentally about knowledge, its nature and its limits. And the basic idea is that knowledge is limited to the five senses and the extension of the five senses through the methods of the hard sciences. And so, given that that's the nature of knowledge, seeing is believing in the the general culture, to know something means that you have in some way or another to interact with it by way of the five senses, and with the extension of instrumentation and science, that follows from that then, given that's the nature of knowledge, that knowledge is fundamentally limited to the deliverances of the hard sciences. So years ago, uh, Time Magazine had a cover story on how the world is going to end. And it had a treatment in there about the fact that the universe is running out of entropy and uh, eventually it's going to die a death where there will be no heat or light or, or or, or very, very little to no motion and the universe is winding down. And that, that, that was not what was interesting to me. What was really, really interesting to me was what the first paragraphs of the article in Time said. Here's what it said. 
It said for millennia, human beings have wanted to know how all this was going to end. Unfortunately, until recently, the only place they could look for answers was religion and philosophy, which really amounts to nothing but speculation. Now, for the first time in the history of the human race, science has moved into this area of inquiry, and for the first time, we are finally getting answers to our questions. California Framework, Time Magazine, a difference in the cognitive understanding of science relative to philosophy, ethics, and religious claims. Now, given that the secular culture is fundamentally about the fact that you can only know things in the hard sciences, or at least ideally know things in the hard sciences, as a result of that, we get the following three things that happen. The first thing that happens is we have the marginalization of Christianity. The marginalization of Christianity. Let me illustrate this by the Columbine tragedy that happened years ago. I'll never forget when the Columbine tragedy happened, what was so vivid about that event for me, not only was the tragedy vivid, but for a good week or longer, the entire nation was trying to find answers to our questions. And if you turned on CNN or ABC, NBC, CBS, if you looked at Time and Newsweek magazine, everybody was asking the question, what is happening to the youth of America? Why is this taking place? And, and, and Dan Rather, Tom Brokaw, and Peter Jennings, and Newsweek and Time all turned to S-C-I-E-N-T-I-S-T-S to answer the question. And so on the front of Newsweek magazine, two or three days after Columbine, was a picture of the human brain, and the question on the cover was, does a defect in brain chemistry cause incidents like Columbine? And it was the neuroscientist who was given authority to tell us what was going on. Now, I'm, I have a science background. I'm not a, I love science, but I'm not a for scientism, which is the overstatement of science's value. There was not a single minister or youth pastor that was asked to bring his or her expertise to the table. Were ministers involved in Columbine? Sure. What was their role? Comforting the victims. It was as though they got to play the national anthem, and when the real game got going, they were very gently ushered off the field, and the real players, the scientists, came on the field. This has also led to this idea that science and science alone is, gives us our ideal of knowledge. This has led not only to to the marginalization of Christianity, but to, as I've said before, relativism in religion and ethics. I remember uh, uh, flying on a plane uh, years ago with my wife, and we were watching the in-flight movie, and it, was a, it won the, the uh, film award in, in Hollywood for the best amateur film, and it was pretty well done. It was called A Stolen Summer. And it was about two little boys in the Chicago area who had, were out on summer vacation. One was about um, 14 years old and the other was about 11. This 14-year-old boy was Catholic and his little 11-year-old buddy was Jewish. And the 14-year-old was concerned that his little Jewish friend was going to go to hell because he didn't believe in Jesus. And so he kept trying to talk to him about Jesus during summer vacation. He got him on his knees in the garage one day and tried to get him to pray. He took him to see his priest. Um, he did a number of things to try to convert his little Jewish friend to Christianity. At the end of the movie, the little boy has an accident and he's killed. And the closing scene is the funeral. And the, Christian, the Catholic young man meets the mother and father as they're all exiting uh, the viewing at the funeral. And, the, and the, the Catholic boy says to the mom and dad, I really am sorry for the way I treated your son. I'm asking you to forgive me because I now know that it doesn't matter what you believe. What matters is that you're sincere and you approach God with an earnest heart. Now, you could have heard a pin drop <laughs> as you can now when that was said because that is communicating the idea that we can't know one way or the other wh whether a religion is true and all that matters is that you are earnest and sincere in believing whatever you want to believe for you. By the way, 
We had some Jewish uh, speakers at the university uh, two weeks ago held a luncheon. These are uh, followers of Jesus. Uh, they're Messianic Jews. And one of the speakers uh, named Rosenberg, who's been on CNN, ABC, uh, he's a journalist, said that one of the most anti-Semitic things that you can do is to fail to, to share Jesus Christ with a Jew on the grounds that they don't need to hear it because they're Jewish. He said that is anti-Semitic, and I, and I agree with him on that. Finally, we've lost a concept of Jesus Christ as an intelligent person. We no longer think of Jesus of Nazareth as an intellectual leader of culture. Time Magazine did a feature where they, they had, I think, the 50 top thinkers in Western history, and Jesus was not on that list. You get your standard list, Einstein's on there and a few other people, but Jesus wasn't on the list. Now, the point I want to make is that we think of Jesus as holy, we think of him as powerful, uh, we think of him as kind, but we don't think of him as smart. We don't think of him as intellectually sophisticated. And I don't have time here this evening to demonstrate in the scriptures that this is true, but he didn't simply speak to farm folk and to blue-collar workers, which, in which I was raised in a blue-collar family, and I'm sure glad he spoke to them. He also spoke to the university professors of his day and debated and dialogued them with them in public. And you have to understand that the ideas that Jesus set in motion have had a greater impact on shaping the course of history than anybody else's ideas. Jesus Christ is smart. And what we need to communicate to our young people is that following Jesus Christ is to be a thoughtful life. It's to be a thoughtful life. So this is how we got here. Where we're at is a secular culture that defines knowledge by, with science alone. And the religious community has withdrawn to faith and feeling as, an, as a way of protecting itself from secular thinkers. Now, very, very briefly, I want to close by, by giving you some suggestions about what we can do here. I want to give you three quick suggestions. Number one, we have to restore cognitive language to our schools and our churches. We have to restore cognitive language to our schools and our churches. When I go in an ACSI school or a Christian school, and if I see words like faith on there and hope and those kinds of things, for every time I see faith, I want to see knowledge. I want to see reason. I want to see truth emphasized. We, we've got to stop talking so much about faith, and we need to start talking more about knowledge and about the role of reason in the Christian life. You wouldn't imagine, would you, that following Jesus Christ would not be thoughtful? Don't you think we should be thoughtful about this? And so in my view, we need to spread the disease by adopting self-descriptors that are cognitive in nature. We need to start talking about ourselves. You know, instead of a faith united church, we ought to have knowledge united church or something of that sort. <laughs> but, but we need to start using the K word in describing our, our community because we do have a body of knowledge and we need to start thinking of ourselves cognitively in addition to affectively and volitionally. All are important. Secondly, we need to teach our parishioners how to defend their faith. We need to, to, to teach our children and our parishioners how to defend their faith. Conferences like this are absolutely crucial because if we can help you and encourage you and give you some training, if we can give you some resources by way of uh, CDs and videos and books, and you can become a little stimulated down the road and get a, get a little bit more trained in this, then you can spread this disease elsewhere because we want, to, not, we want to infect people with this disease of being able to know why they believe what they believe. And we need to see an outbreak of Sunday school classes that meet for six to eight weeks to talk about this. We need reading groups to form occasionally where people read substantial books that are a little bit hard to understand. And by the way, I read books that are a little bit over my head, and that's good for me, 
because it stretches my mind, and I think it would be, and I just recommend that to you. Don't be discouraged if you read a book that you get here, and it's a little bit hard for you because you're growing by reading something like that. So we need to recapture a cognitive self-understanding and use the K word, the knowledge word. We need to teach people in our churches how to defend their faith and know why they believe what they believe. That means to elevate the value of apologetics. And finally, we need to present Jesus Christ as an intellectual leader to our young people. We have many, many smart young people that don't believe their smartness has anything to do with their Christianity. They are told that if they want to follow Jesus, they need to become loving, and they need to be honest and good and and have love and joy and peace and patience and so on, and all that's a part of it. But they are not encouraged to develop and exercise their smart little minds for the kingdom of God. And we need in our youth groups and in our training of young people to emphasize the importance of them flourishing in their minds and in their studies for Jesus' sake. And I can envision our children becoming the finest students in the schools they attend. We are seeing in in our day, and this has happened in the last 20 years, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are seeing ACSI schools turning from being a little a little ghetto for Christian kids who don't want to face the world and they get prayer at at school, to places now where our Christian schools are teaching literature and history better than the public schools. Our SAT scores are higher. We're doing a better job of educating. And if we're going to start a Christian school and put Jesus' name on it, we ought to be better at educating than people who don't have his name on it, all things being equal. Does that make sense to you? You're welcome to say amen to that if you'd like to. So I want to live, if God would grant me, long enough to where I see this thing turned around first in the evangelical community and then in the broader community. That's why I take time to come to conferences like this. That's why my colleagues and I feel honored to be here. We count it a privilege to come to things like this. We look forward to it because we believe in the movement that we're generating and that you're a part of that movement. You're one with us in this movement. We may have different roles, but we're on the same team here. So there's good and bad news about Bill Craig's story. The good news is it is absolutely thrilling. The bad news is it doesn't happen very often, but there is one final piece of good news. I could easily foresee these kinds of things happening more and more and more as more Christians learn why they believe what they believe. Let's pray. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.